Buonasera a tutti, good evening and welcome to the Italian Radio Hour. Io sono Viviana and I would like to welcome back our regular listeners and also welcome any new listeners and be sure also to like us on Instagram and Facebook at the Italian Radio Hour and subscribe to our YouTube channel to catch up on any past video interviews. Vorrei dare il benvenuto ai nostri ascoltatori da tutto il mondo. Grazie per essere con noi anche oggi mentre continuiamo il nostro viaggio per l'Italia e la cultura italiana. It is not a coincidence that lives woven in a very interesting way. And uh, in my recent academic experience within the Italian American uh, Studies Conference in Pittsburgh, I had the, the pleasure to listen to um, a woman, a professor, of English at the new uh, Jersey City University that I truly admire for her scholarly work. I'm very honored that you have with us today Edwige Junta. And uh, as I said before, she's the uh, she's a professor of English at the New Jersey City University. And uh, she has trained scores of students, uh, many first uh, generation immigrants like herself in the art of memoir, and also has taught memoir for writers of all backgrounds and levels in the US and Italy. Uh, she's also the regular contributor to Italian American studies and the founder of The Field. She's the author of Writing with an Accent, Contemporary Italian American uh, Women Authors. She has also co-edited uh, six anthologies, uh, among which the Milk of uh, Almonds, Italian American Women, Women Writers, on food and culture, and one that I truly adore um, with Joseph Shora, Embroidery Stories, Interpreting Women's Domestic Needlework from the Italian Diaspora, and the latest and the greatest, and the one that we will be focusing our conversation on today, along with Marianne Trasciati, talking to the girls, intimate and political essays on the Triangle Fire that is coming um, in, well, in March is going to be one year old. But before we bring Professor Junta with us, a little publicità. Do you want to parli italiano? Do you want to learn, improve, or master your Italian? Istituto Mondo Italiano can help. Located in the heart of Regent Square, Mondo Italiano offers small group classes and one-on-one -on -one private tutoring to help you learn Italian in no time. Visit us online at www.istitutomondoitaliano.org. Buonasera Edwige, uh, benvenuta al nostro programma. <laughs> grazie, grazie. It's a pleasure to be joining you. Are you speaking English or Italian? <laughs> uh, well, we uh, let's keep it in English, but obviously any Italian, Italian may, will come may out. Come out. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> so obviously, the um, I mentioned that you're first uh, generation uh, here in the U.S., like myself. And uh, would you like to share with our listeners a little bit about your background, where you're coming from, and when or what brought you to the United States? Sure. I'd be glad to. Well, I was born in Gela, um, Sicily. That's my hometown. Uh, and actually, I just uh, just did an interview with, uh, with the poet Natalie Handel. Um, on uh, on my relationship to my city. And I have two cities in Italy. One is Catania, and that's my adoptive city. And the other, the other one is Gela. And I have a more complicated relationship, but still very intense with Gela. And I, I grew up there, and I did my university studies as an undergraduate in Catania. And like many Sicilians, I wanted to leave. I am the granddaughter of uh, um, an immigrant. My grandfather was in Argentina from 1924 to 1928. Uh, and then his brother in the 1950s moved to Argentina. So I have a whole family there in Argentina, but that so many Sicilians, uh, um, well, it afflicted me too, or or pushed me on. And I just um, I just wanted to leave. And, mm -hmm. and I ended up, uh, um, getting this opportunity to study for a master's in English at the University of Miami. Mm -hmm. um, I was encouraged to, to study comparative literature and Italian literature, but I wanted to study English mm -hmm. and all its manifestations. So I got a PhD and, um, and I studied uh, um, modernism. I did a dissertation on James Joyce and I didn't know want to do, have anything to do with Italian American culture, or Italian culture. I wanted to become uh, immersed uh, in, in mm -hmm. a culture that did not remind me of my origins. But I think uh, um, it was almost inevitable 
to connect uh, with the, the Italian American community and especially um, women. Um, and it has um, um, really changed my life professionally, but also in the way in which I understand myself as someone who was born in Italy. And as you can hear from my accent, is very much still Italian, but also someone who identifies as Italian American. And my professional work um, as, a, as a scholar, as an editor, as a teacher, as a writer, is born out of the tension between these two identities. Yes, that's the short that's version. <laughs> no, it is indeed an internal struggle that uh, we uh, first generation always go through because the more time we spend here in the US, which might be now longer than um, the time that we have spent in Italy, but we're still considered Italian. And then when we go back home, they considered us a little bit the Americans. So it's, it's, um, we're a little bit of both, and uh, but it's actually a growth opportunity. That's how I see it. So sometimes it's a, it is indeed later in life that we go back to our roots and we understand and we want to, we ask um, ourselves questions and we start the internal uh, search uh, process. And again, it might be also academic or just a personal journey. Whereas, you know, coming to the United States, you want to embrace these uh, new experience, full throttle, and kind of leave behind um, what is uh, familiar for the uh, for the unknown. Um, the first time that I um, came across with some of your uh, fantastic work was indeed um, uh, with the uh, embroidery stories interpreting women's domestic needlework from the Italian diaspora that you edited along with Professor Joseph um, uh, Shara. Um, can you share with our um, listeners a little bit um, about also the tradition, the deep tradition of embroideries that um, I remember, you know, the la dote, you know, just uh, the trunk, uh, the good sheets, the good, um, the uh, uh, dowry, I think is 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 called. Uh, can you tell us a little bit of how you got interested in this type of this type of work, uh, whether you had a personal story that um, made you sensitive to this um, to this quest? Well, I think it's, um, it, you know, it's interesting how you were talking about, you know, the, you know how you also experienced uh, the, this productive tension between different identities. I think that sometimes uh, the journeys that we end up doing land us into places and situations uh, that enable us uh, to fully understand or explore things that we encountered early in our lives and we did not fully understand. And I'll, I'll, I'll bring a couple of examples. So um, on, on really, on, first of all, I could take you to, but could take you to a tour of my house. I would take you to my bedroom, at the foot of my bed, that there is a linen chest, which I bought here in the United States with my mother and it's full of my dowry and it includes uh, things that my mother um, bought for me also things that were embroidered, um, hand embroidered and uh, some a few items that belong to my, to my grandmother. And uh, of course, when my daughter got married, I gave her a little daughter as well. So that, that tradition was very strong. But if I, have, you know, if I go back as a child, I remember my mother calling me and my older sister into this little room and opening this big chest and showing us la dote and we rolled our eyes and we wanted nothing to do with this but this was extremely important um, for my mother and as I grew older I started to appreciate it a little bit um, it wasn't until I really um, started studying the tradition um, of um, of Italian women and really understand that the significant daughter that I understood that the daughter was a gift that could not be touched. Even when women did not have the ra right to own property, mm -hmm. their daughter that, that, that belonged to them. And it was something that was given by the mother to the daughter. So there is this sense of lineage and connection and gift giving that creates almost a sacred space between uh, a mother and daughter. And so um, doing the work I did with, um, with Joshora, 
um, looking at all these different aspects of both the creative and the historical and the cultural of embroidery, it enabled me to both draw from and revisit that experience. I also had an aunt, I was named after her, um, who was disabled and so her, her, you know, she couldn't use her right hand or, um, or arm, uh, but she embroidered with her left hand. Mm. Um, and I, there is a whole other story there between about the relationship between uh, between disability and creativity, uh, particularly growing up in a small Sicilian town. So these were very very personal, but also um, I certainly was aware of the Rica Matrici, mm -hmm. and 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 both as artistic figures, but also as exploited figures of my mm -hmm. island. Um, what I found fascinating, uh, and this is a question I've always asked myself ever since I started uh, studying uh, Italian-American women and trying to understand uh, what is that do they have in common and what, what makes us Italian-American women? What do we carry with us? Mm -hmm. And what we carry with us is, uh, is the stories, the recipes, the memories, um, and also sometimes these objects. So there is the wonderful bedspread that appears in Ellen Barolini's Umbertina, the one item that Umbertina purchases as a symbol of abundance and connection to her land and then ends up in the Museum of Immigration and their name by name, but then disappears. So, so embroidery is really a catalyst uh, um, for both very intimate and personal experiences, but also to explore um, um, the, the development of a cultural identity after emigration and how connections are maintained. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, and also there was a very nice exhibit for quite some time at the Italian American Museum of Los Angeles, if I remember correctly that I wish Los Angeles was just across the street because I would have loved to to go and say hopefully hopefully maybe that exhibit will make it to the East Coast. Um, can you tell us uh, do you know much about the how they organized the display? Were you able to? Um, uh, I, go I, out there? I wasn't able to go. Although we were the, we were very fortunate to have a presentation mm. of um, talking to the girls at the book on the Triangle Fire there. Um, but since we're talking about exhibits, I also want to mention uh, the symposium of Biancheria, mm -hmm. uh, which was organized by the Calandra Institute, it was really the impetus for this book. And, you know, and jo Josh Shara was uh, the organizer of this conference. And at this conference, uh, um, a number of authors uh, presented their work, and some of these authors then ended up being part of, uh, of embroidered stories. But um, what is remarkable, and I think it's imp and, and extremely important thing, is the the valuing of material culture and the understanding of culture inheritance and the way in which Italian American organizations such as the Italian American Museum are, are paying attention to it and honoring it. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, uh, are you by chance, since we were talking about um, uh, familiar with, uh, uh, it might be a little bit off topic, the uh, El Museo del Tombolo in Mirambella in Baccari, or, or I, not. No, I'm not. Although, although the word the tombolo makes me think immediately of my paternal grandmother. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, I have to confess that I my sewing skills are non-existent, you know, which is kind of paradoxical <laughs> for <laughs> someone who co-edited a book called Embroider Stories. Um, but you know, I think you know there there are there are the way in which we look at these at this tradition of the embroideries, they are the makers. Mm -hmm. And then uh, um, what do we do with with the cultural memories that we receive? And in fact, in embroidery stories, as you know, there, there are uh, stories and also visual representation that show how um, the work of embroidery can mm -hmm. also be very generative and create uh, other work. And actually, that's a really... You know, if we think of, uh, of the work, the image that is at the center of the, the commemoration of the Triangle Fire, it, mm -hmm. it's a piece of a needlework. It's a shirtwaist. And that was the brainchild of uh, writer Anne Lancelot, mm -hmm. that we need to credit her with having come up with this extraordinary idea that has become a symbol 
um, for uh, the memory of the Triangle Fire. So since we have been uh, mentioning now the uh, Triangle Fire and uh, the uh, your recent uh, publication with uh, Marianne Trashati talking to the girls intimate and political essays on the Triangle Fire. Uh, let's um, uh, focus to uh, just two minutes to uh, remind our audience about uh, what happened. Uh, so it was uh, March 25th of uh, 1911 when a fire broke out on the eighth floor of the Ash Building in Greenwich Village in uh, New York. And uh, the top three floors housed the Triangle Waste Company, a factory where approximately 500 workers, mostly young immigrant women and girls, labor to produce fashionable cotton blouses known as waste. Um, the fire killed 146 workers in a mere 15 minutes, uh, but pierced the perpetual conscience of citizens everywhere. The Ash Building had been considered a modern fireproof structure, but inadequate fire safety regulations left the workers inside unprotected. The tragedy of the fire and the resulting movements for change were pivotal in shaping workers' rights and unions. Uh, the, the book, the anthology, is a powerful collection of diverse voices, and they puts together the stories from writers, artists, activists, scholars, and family members of the Triangle Workers. 19 contributors from across the globe speak of a singular event with remarkable impact. 111 years, uh, we're going 12 after the tragic incident, Talking to the Girls articulates a story of contemporary global relevance and stands as an act of collective testimony a written memorial to the triangle victims. Now, let me ask you first, how familiar were you with this event when you still lived in Sicily? Because um, it is something that I have come to find out in two different, um, two different ways. Not through what I was taught in school, uh, definitely not, it was probably not included. Maybe I finished school too, too, too early for those books to include all these important events. Um, there is a beautiful mural in Orgosolo. I was, I spent quite some time in Sardinia uh, this, uh, this past summer. That definitely caught my attention. Those murals, all of them, each one of them have a very interesting message. They're not just decorations for the walls. They're actually, I think, a conversation to with the, the, the passerbys, the citizens of um, then go and see them. And the other one is indeed by being exposed to uh, your work and some other events that usually are celebrated or commemorated in, in March from Women's Day and so forth. So I was wondering uh, what was your experience uh, and knowledge of this event? Um, prior to coming to, to the US? Well, you know, what I was saying before, how sometimes our journey takes us full circle. Um, this anthology is my last anthology. I say my last anthology because I've done quite a few and they've been very important projects. So for me, anthologies are tools for community building, not only to explore issues from a multiplicity of perspectives of bringing in different voices and views, uh, um, but also to really create a sense of kinship a bit among a group of different people who gather to, to explore an issue. Um, if you go back to the 1970s when I was still a teenager and, um, and becoming a feminist, uh, um, I first heard about the Triangle Fire uh, when I was uh, um, 17. And um, um, I probably heard about it on the news. Mm -hmm. um, I grew up in a family where we watched the news <laughs> lunch, mm -hmm. at lunchtime, probably something. It was, was on during the meals just to catch up. Yes, what the musical like. score is. Uh, and I was, um, um, I was very, very involved already. I started my own uh, um, 
activism and Angela had the good tradition because Angela, the first feminist group in Sicily was, was started by Maria Rosa Cotropelli um, and other um, um, Sicilian women. And that was about um, to start also a program at the local radio. And, um, and I read about this by, I did not know it was called Triangle. Mm -hmm. I did not know there were any Italian or Jewish workers. I didn't know who was their, their background. I only knew that women had died at the beginning of the 20th century in a factory fire in New York City. And that really made an impression uh, um, because it appears uh, in the feminist memory of that period. There is a song by Movimento Feminista Romano, maybe you should play it for, uh, for your audience, called Otto Marzo. Mm -hmm. Ricordatevi di noi, siamo morte in una fabbrica. And, and during the feminist uh, marches on Vietnam in Catania, I remember very clearly um, the memory of, of these women who had died in the fire and feeling like we were there, remembering them, holding them in our hearts. And then just you know, a year earlier, uh, I had talked about this fire in, this, uh, in, in my feminist program, which was called Sfruttata con Onore. Mm -hmm. So that was was in the in the back of my memory, wasn't active. And then it wasn't until I started connecting with Italian American women, and especially historian Jennifer Guglielmo. Um, Janet Zandi was done, working class uh, studies scholar was done incredible work. Kim Ragusa, the, um, and, and we actually started a group that was called the Collective of Italian American Women that the Triangle Fire, now with this new awareness that uh, many of the women and girls who died in the fire were Italian, as it turned out, many were Sicilian, that I became much more interested. And in fact, uh, in uh, 2001, uh, the Collective of Italian American Women, which now is known as Malia and only exists as a virtual presence on through a book, for a group on, on Facebook, we organized. Uh, in collaboration with Casa Italiana Zerilli Marimo at New York University, uh, the 90th commemoration of the Triangle Fire. And as far as I know, that's the first time that there was a public Italian-American commemoration of the fire. As you probably know, um, um, the, the Triangle Fire has been claimed as a chapter in Italian-American history only relatively recently. Mm -hmm. um, and I am, you know, without going into ethnic pride, because uh, um, this is a book, it's a, it's a collective book, it's a book of intercultural uh, dialogue. Uh, um, it is important that um, two Italian-American women have, have taken on uh, this project to bring in together um, contributors from different backgrounds, uh, different disciplines and different parts of the world uh, to look at the way in which the Triangle Fire um, resonates uh, um, uh, for all of us. So I did, uh, our, I organized with Jennifer Guglielmo and uh, then we used this commemoration and then Triangle Fire kept popping up, you know, it, you know, a section in a book, in an article, uh, um, inviting, um, in, appears in, in embroidered stories. And after I finished my last anthology before, before this one, um, Triangle called me. Mm -hmm. And and I and I felt uh, this sense of urgency and 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 there was this wonderful uh, um, woman friend colleague uh, that um, I wanted uh, to work with, uh, and Maria Antrashati, who had, as the president of the Remember the Triangle Fire Coalition, has taken a leading role in promoting the creation of a Triangle Fire Memorial, which will be inaugurated uh, this year. So so. What is interesting is that the Triangle Fire existed in the Italian, entered the Italian, Italian memory through the feminist movement, but kind of waned and disappeared. I, with Italian American women, uh, grabbed uh, this experience and trying to find a place for it. At the same time, uh, um, the women of Tomponomastica Femminile in Sicily mm -hmm. um, started an initiative uh, to, to remember the workers uh, and so the um, memorial sites have been created uh, in uh, the places in southern Italy where these women uh, were born and then all sorts of exchanges have been happening Laura Boldrini um, president della Camera Deputati she came to visit the Triangle Fire 
Uh, and now we are in a back and forth dialogue, and I'm delighted to tell you that the book is being translated into Italian. So that is Italian. That is fantastic because um, the only uh, piece of um, the only article that I was able to find in Italian it was uh, the one that was published last year by La Repubblica. And uh, uh, so where he says, La strage di operai in una fabbrica di New York all'inizio del XX secolo, un dramma che viene ripercorso in un saggio del quale pubblichiamo un saggio di introduzione. Yes. Um, and uh, it, was, it was finally, um, it, it was about time, pretty much, because uh, this reality, I mean, this, uh, this uh, event that happened in uh, 1911, continues to have a thread still in today's society where we are into um, uh, not only just the fast fashion, uh, but also in uh, uh, working conditions. They are not up to standards. They are not human in many parts of the world. Uh, but our desire to have, to have it now pushes those urges into um, also a system that favors, you know, sometimes profits over um, you know, uh, more human uh, conditions um, in order to get to certain uh, goals. So we had also some other guests um, where we talked, we focused a little bit about the clothing industry, like in Prato, how they, um, the Icenciaioli, the, the whole idea of kind of recycling, giving a second uh a second uh, life to a garment. But unfortunately, that is not the privilege that these young women got to experience. Uh, most of them had just arrived. They were, they were new when these, uh, um, these um, fire occurred. Can you tell us a little bit about the dynamics, if we can just step back a little bit, Absolutely. again, with the description of uh, an event, why it is also so, not only just the, uh, an, the enormous number of victims, 146 in 15 wow. minutes, but the young ages. So tell us a little bit about. Yes, yes. And I just want to open a very brief parenthesis because it's very important for me to, to acknowledge and give, give credit where credit is due. And in Italy, there has been actually a lot of interest in recent years. There is, there is a book on uh, the Triangle Fire, a small book called Camicia Te Bianca by Esther Rizzolicata, who has tracked down the birth certificate of all the Italian born victims. So she's done incredible genealogical work. There is a fabulous, fabulous song by a Sicilian singer, uh, Francesca Incudine, called No Name. And, and the song has an English title, and the song is in Italian and Sicilian. And it's extraordinary also about the Triangle Fire. There are musicals, uh, there are performances. So there is a great interest in Casa Internazionale delle Donne. Last year, um, um, hosted the presentation of... Uh, of talking talking to the girls and you know Anna Maria Crispino, who's the editor of Legendaria, has played a key role also in pushing for the translation of this book, which will be published by by Jacob Belli. So I think there is there is a there is a, a it's very interesting how how the energy in different places at some point begins to coalesce and intersect, uh, and then the initiative um, large. But let me answer your question. You know the dynamics of uh, of um, of the fire have been studied in great detail. So um, for um, your audience, if you're interested in really learning about the details, that are the most important uh, study, I would say, is David Vondrella Triangle, the fire that changed America, um, and but also Leon Stein, who, who, whose book Triangle, the Triangle Fire was, uh, um, was the first study of the Triangle Fire. And Leon Stein actually interviewed the, the survivors. So, so that's how also many of the dynamic the dynamics have been reconstructed. As you as you said, the, the Triangle Waste Company occupied the, the top three floors of the Ash Building, now renamed the Brown Building, and the fire started on on the eighth floor, most likely um, started by a live ash in the bin of a cutter, presumably Isidor Abramovitz, whose son Martin wrote an essay that appears in the book, an extraordinary essay. Um, because uh, um, the floors were crammed, kept unclean, the bins were full of fabric and flammable material. It was a, a spring day in March, the windows were open, there was a breeze, it was a recipe for disaster. 
and there were there were no fire drills and the way in which they tried uh, to put out the fire was with buckets of water um so the fire starts on the eighth floor fire goes up um they could not alert the ninth floor because the only way the eighth floor could communicate uh, with the ninth floor was by calling the tenth floor where the offices of the bosses were and through a series of complicated things because they had a new machine a sort of like fax like machine which somehow they were using instead of the telephone which would have been much faster by the time the tenth floor gets alerted the woman who responds in a panic goes to alert the bosses and forgets to alert the ninth floor. So by the time the workers on the ninth floor realized there was a fire, there was, it was too late. At that, the locked door and the mm -hmm. trial of the owners was really impinged um, on, upon the whether or not they knew that the doors are lo were locked because according to, to labor laws, they were not allowed to keep the doors locked during uh, work hours. However, the doors were kept locked because the women were searched every, every day to see if they had stolen a piece of fabric, if a, a shirt waist or something. So, and we're not even gonna go into the issue of sexual harassment, which is a whole other, other um, um, dimension. So imagine these, uh, these workers uh, who are trying to get out uh, um, and the doors are locked. Many of them saved themselves uh, thanks uh, to a hero, an Italian-American hero, Joseph Zito, the elevator operator who went up and down and, um, um, and saved maybe 100, 150 people this way. Right. And, and the stories of survival of uh, the workers are really extraordinary. One of the contributors to our book is Susanna Pred Bass. She's the great niece of two triangle workers. Uh, Rossi Wiener and Katie Wiener. Rossi died in the fire. Katie who was 17 years old. She saved herself because when she saw the last elevator car leave and she realized looking at the fires behind that that was it. Mm -hmm. She did this, she jumped and grabbed the elevator cable from the ninth floor and sliding down, landing on the heads Mm -hmm. of her companions and one of her friends held her up she was hurt but she saved you know she saved her life so um the triangle fire um was the result of neglect lack of adequate adequate safety measures uh, and plain disregard for human life in mm -hmm. the name of profit and it so awakened and shook the attention of uh, all those New Yorkers who witnessed the fire. In half, in, this happened in half an hour. And it was a beautiful uh, uh, spring day on a Saturday. And so all New, New Yorkers were out and they all rushed uh, and they saw these women, the women, the women either they died in the fire or they jumped from the ninth floor. Some they tried to escape uh, through the fire escape, which collapsed under their weight. So it was a, it was a it was a horrific spectacle, and and something happened. Something shifted in the consciousness, and politicians became uh, um, took a leading roles, uh, um, and and there were many legislations that were um, that, that followed the Triangle Fire. And maybe here we want just to remember the great Francis Perkins, mm -hmm. who was not the Secretary of Labor yet. Uh, um, but she was that day, she was uh, nearby having tea with a friend and she heard the commotion and, um, and, and she witnessed it and, and promised to herself that she would devote the rest of her life to make sure that tragedies such as these do not happen. And at the same time, uh, um, I think it is important to realize that the, um, the horrors of the Triangle Fire far from disappeared because they continue to happen in different parts of the world, uh, um, in, in Thailand, uh, Mm -hmm. um, um, in, 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 in Bangladesh, uh, in, in many, many parts of the world, and even in, in the United States. And when Marianne and I were working on, on, on this book, what we wanted, we did not want to have simply a collection of essays that was a record of the past. The record of the past is extremely important, and there are historical books that do that. 
we approached uh, um, uh, the book as as editors were interested in 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 stories and activism. Mm -hmm. And the question that we were asking our contributors is, why did you become interested in the Triangle Fire? And how did this spur on your activism? And what form did the activism take in your life? Um, and the story that emerged were extraordinary. And obviously, we didn't want just one constituency. That's why there is a diverse group. But we wanted to end um, very meaningfully with, with Kalpona actor. Mm -hmm. um, an internationally renowned activist uh, um, who speaks about the that the Zerin Fai and the Rana Plaza collapse. Uh, and when she um, attended uh, the centennial of the Triangle Fire, um, famously, uh, she told uh, um, the audience uh, um, that um, we were still in 1911. Mm -hmm. 1911 is not gone. So. The Triangle Fire, um, as we approach it in this book, uh, um, it is about this particular historical event, the way, the, pl the place it has in, in American memory, in, in women's memory. Um, Jewish and Italian American obviously have had a very direct involvement, but also the way it speaks to many, many uh, constituencies. And, I could keep talking. So. No, no, it's a, it's indeed, it's not, uh, as you said, it's not necessarily the recollection of the lives of uh, uh, those uh, uh, workers, uh, but their stories are still remembered and brought up and again, interwoven um, through the experiences of the contributors, whether uh, we have the figure of a son uh, or, uh, a great grandchild, a teacher, and uh, studious. And I actually, uh, I believe you are the first one that started to teach a program, uh, a course about uh, the uh, Triangle uh, Factory. Can you tell us a little bit about first? Uh, maybe how this program is uh, is planned out, and how other universities or also other entities with a younger audience can already start to get uh, uh, sensitive towards uh, uh, start having this conversation. Uh, because I think the, the sooner we start having the conversations, the more we can uh, bring it forward and not repeat the same mistakes of, of uh, the past. So can, can you tell us a little bit about your program? Absolutely, and also want to point to the Remember the Triangle Fire, the Remember the Triangle Fire Coalition. Their website has resources also for for educators, uh, so um, that would be um, something I would recommend. With the Triangle Fire has been incorporated in uh, in courses, you know, whether there are, in, and I myself I've included in courses on on women, in courses on immigration, but. This is a course that is entirely on the triangle, um, on the triangle fire, um, and I think a similar course is recently now being created uh, at the Hunter College. Um, I created a course as part of the general education program at New Jersey City University um, uh, when uh, the program uh, um, has created these capstone courses. So their courses were uh, students from all majors. They had to take these. Uh, this kind of senior course, uh, and uh, they had the opportunity of, uh, of working in different uh, areas and different disciplinary areas. And, and the way in which I, so I have students who are criminal justice major, fire science major, computer science major, creative writing, history, business, you name it. Uh, and so how do you bring them all together? Well, the first initiative, you know, this is for me, the Triangle Fire is memory work, right? And, you know, you you were there at my the, uh, plenary address I, I gave, uh, yes, so where well, the question that, that I asked is, how do we remember as Italian American, you know? Memory is work. When we say memory work, is you have got to really work actively to remember. And the first project that we do is a name project every student has to choose the name of a worker. And the first assignment is to remember the name. Mm -hmm. It's a very simple, basic assignment, but it's also a first step for, towards some connection. 
from that, the students uh, um, work uh, on learning um, as much as possible on, uh, on this work. Uh, and there, there is the wonderful uh, resources of the Kiel Archive at Cornell University. It's a digital archive. So they, they look at that certificate. They look at photographs. They look at all the information. And then they write an essay, which is not only an account of who um, this person was, but also a reflection uh, on the process uh, of researching this person, remembering his name, person, and developing the relationship with someone they did not know was unrelated to them, but they, they are standing for that for that person. And this act, uh, um, very simple act of advocacy, also is pursued uh, through the chalk. The chalking is uh, uh, is something again that would encourage your audience uh, to consider doing this march. Uh, um, it's some it's a project created by Ruth Sergo. And the people get are given by Ruth the name and address of a worker, and you go at the home address of the worker, and you get on your knees with color chalk, and you write the name, the address, the age of the person, uh, and died in the Triangle Fire, March twenty fifth, nineteen eleven. Now I used to do this with my students. Uh, we used to get a couple of addresses and do that, and it was fantastic because uh, we also went to the commemoration. Uh, they stood there holding the shirt waists uh, with the names of the workers. It, they were red that day at the building. We went to the ninth floor. Amazing experience. Then the pandemic happened. Mm -hmm. And so we could not go there. And so um, um, sometimes uh, when uh, you have a problem, a challenge, it can become something that can benefit, uh, um, can benefit you creatively. So now every... I, my, each of the students does a chalk project for their worker. So mm -hmm. not only they're researching, not only they're writing, they're reflecting, now they have to do something visual. Mm -hmm. And some will do it in front of their house, some will do it uh, at the public park, uh, some all sorts of creative uh, uh, projects. So that's the first project. Now, I'm, I'm describing this project in detail because I think that anybody can do that. Mm -hmm. And because it's also a very powerful experience. I would assume, you know, even the research, you, you already started to get into what the life of these individuals could have been and what they look like and what their family members were all about and what they left behind. But I think uh, also the chalking, um, uh, the chalking experience, writing out the date, be there, feeling it must be very overwhelming emotionally. And that's kind of maybe the experience that hits them. Um, and you know it is it is uh, overwhelming and um my, my students have done such extraordinary project etrit abdullah um she's um she's a dancer she choreographed and performed mm -hmm. a ballet at washington square park uh, inspired by the triangle fire incredible i only saw pictures i can just imagine what the whole performance would but the pictures were just amazing like they were so full of message yes and you know these are and you know I, I think this is what this is what the heart of education is caring mm -hmm. and wanting to hold on to what you learn and I think the triangle fire offers a unique opportunity to do that I think it's you know my students can do different projects uh, and so one you know they can uh, they to do projects of research and then their own capstone project. Uh, um, but uh, if yeah, if I have students who are studying education, I encourage them to do projects on teaching the Triangle Fire in middle school or high school or elementary school and designing also um, um, less lesson plans. Uh, there are also many wonderful books uh, um, for all levels. So. so um, and these actually, in thinking about teaching the Triangle Fire at the elementary school level, for example, it allows for really exploring very important issues such as how do you um, um, address uh, traumatic events uh, with a younger population? And I think uh, um, it would be, um, um, I mean, children face trauma. Children face trauma all, all the time. And children who come... Uh, from experience of migration and poverty, they've experienced trauma. So 
um, pretending that trauma doesn't exist uh, is not a way to protect them, but giving, the giving them the tools. Mm -hmm. And so all sorts of pedagogical issues then emerge in conversation um, that the students have with their peers because all the pro pro projects are, uh, are, um, are, are presented. But also like another project that we do, uh, every student has to, do, to pick one, one historical figure. Mm -hmm. It could be uh, Clara Lemlich, uh, um, the heroine of the uprising, or it could be um, could be Al Smith, it could be Isaac Harris and Max Planck, the owners of the Triangle Five. It could be uh, any of the people who are part of the historical context of the Triangle Fire, and everyone has to present these historical characters to the class. Mm -hmm. Again, another project so that you could do it at the college level. You could do it at the high school level, you could do it at the middle school level, you could do it at the elementary school level. Mm -hmm. um, just like memoir, and you know, you, you talk about my work in memoir, I think the best pedagogy this is the, the pedagogy that is flexible enough to be adapted to different contexts. Mm -hmm. Uh, now, we talked about some of the expressions, like, for instance, the chalk project. Can you tell us a little bit what the memorial will incorporate looks like? And um, tell us a little bit for those that might not have the ability to go to New York right now. Uh, what is being done? What's the vision? That is a very nice one. Well, and, uh, I think I think the, the, the appropriate thing to do for this is really to set up uh, <laughs> a meeting uh, with my fabulous co-editor, Marianne Trasciatti, mm -hmm. uh, because uh, that is the, has been the project that she and the Remember Triangle Fire Coalition have, have, uh, have uh, devoted themselves in, um, entirely. And two wonderful architects have won the international competition for the design. Just a couple of things I want to say about the, um, um, the Triangle Fire me Memorial, which is being installed right now on um, the Ash Building, now Brown Building. At the, the center is, uh, is the names, again, mm -hmm. names, and the encounter with the names on the reflective panels. And one of the ways in which many of us were involved in the creation of the City Triangle uh, Memorial was the Collective Ribbon, which was an event yes. that happened in 2019 at the Fashion mm -hmm. Institute of Technology. And all everybody was invited to come and bring a piece of fabric. Mm -hmm. And there were these very, very long tables. And uh, we were able actually, there, there were also sewing machine, electric sewing machine to, to embroider the names uh, of people who were the original owners. I had something that belonged to my grandmother and some that belonged to my mother, something actually that was from my dowry. Mm -hmm. um, and then all these pieces of cloth, uh, they were sewn together. And then they, they, they were used to, to cast the panels that are part of the Triangle Fire Memorial. Um, it's such, and one of the essays in the book is by one of the two architects as designed in Richard John Yu. Um, and it's such a complex and layered and well thought out uh, project uh, from the choice of the material the materials are to um, really how to make the concept of visible memory mm -hmm. and also to do it without altering uh, the landscape. But, but the, the purpose of the memorial is to make memory visible, mm. to rescue um, this historic, historical memory triangle fire from, from the danger of oblivion. Um. Indeed, and then uh, also um, I wanted to uh, say that the the same day that you were actually talking about and reading uh, about uh, um, the triangle factor with talking to the girls, uh, those little coincidences, uh, as I said, it was there was a mundane event. There was indeed the gala for uh, the National Italian American Foundation. And the short was being presented leaving the factory and by a very young uh, Italian uh, girl direct, uh, that she's in her mid twenties and she had heard about the story from this one teacher in Italy. So before moving to the US and she's actually in California, 
when uh, the, um, I guess there was a call for, um, there's the, uh, the, the Russo brothers uh, um, allocate certain funds. She could not but choose to do a, a short about uh, the triangle uh, short factory it is called uh, leaving the factory. So seeing how the new generation is um, again, equally uh, taking an active uh, role into continuing the conversation uh, that it goes beyond being Italian or any other nationality that were represented there is indeed the biggest legacy uh, that uh, um, the anthology, the the memorial, and just having conversations will will leave us uh, will leave us uh, with. And I do would like I, I do have a little request because I have no way of reading it in a proper way. Uh, but if there is any chance that you can read for me Francesca's words, um, and maybe we can leave them as a closing message uh, to this uh, beautiful conversation. Definitely not an exhaustive one. So uh, you can consider yourself invited to come back maybe also with uh, Marianne, um, it will be my pleasure. I wanted to actually take, have this conversation when we're not in March yet, uh, because we want to start the conversation earlier, not just when we're getting to the anniversary to, uh, but again, if we can have you read, yes, words. Um, yes, yeah, give me a second because, <laughs> Um, I am visually impaired, so I need to get this on my computer. <laughs> <laughs> you should have warned me. Uh, I'm bad. I do, I do that all. I do that all the time. But uh, one other thing that I was. Uh, but I, I, uh, I'll be glad to. It's a, such a fantastic, uh, fantastic song. Venite, sorelle, come stigi avvampati. Vi insegna a volare in capo all'America. Siamo come tenere precipitate. Il fumo, la cenere, a mezzo agli strati. Come, sisters, like stars on fire. I will teach you to fly above America, where fallen dark comets, smoke and ash, in the middle of the street. Francesca and Cudine, no name. Well, unfortunately, our time together is up. Today, il Big Ben ha detto stop. It is time for us to say arrivederci alla prossima. We want to thank you for tuning in into the program. If you have any questions or comments, or if you have any travel topics you would like us to address, please contact us at the Italian Radio Hour at gmail.com. We would love to hear from you. Remember, if you or any of your family and friends have missed a prior episode or would like to listen to this episode again, please visit, visit our website at www.istitutomondoitaliano.org and click on the Italian Radio Hour tab. You can also find our video interviews on the Italian Radio Hour YouTube channel. And also you can listen to the program whenever you catch your favorite podcast under the Italian Radio Hour. We would like to thank our guest, Edwige Giunta, uh, our sponsor, Istituto Mondo Italiano and La Boara for the music. Until Uh, next time. Alla prossima. Ciao ciao. Grazie. Ciao a tutti.